Welcome back to the show. It's Abdul Abrani and welcome to Economics with Dr. A. Today we have an amazing episode. I am talking to Bola Olanian, Executive Director of the Sadie Collective, about her experience uh, being an Executive Director, how she got there, but also more importantly about the mission of the Sadie Collective in empowering the next generation of economists and increasing diversity in the profession. You will not want to miss this episode. Check it out. Bola Olanian, Executive Director of the City Collective. Perfect. Bola, I'm really excited to have you on uh, this conversation and to learn more about what you all are doing. I've been following the City Collective. Um, I don't even remember when I started following it, but uh, it feels like I've seen the trajectory just keep on getting steeper and steeper on the progress that you all are doing. And from my understanding, you all have a lot of things uh, coming up in the near future. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think you probably started hearing about us in early 2018, mid 2019. Um, that was when Anna Gifty and Fanta Troy um, were working and going to school in the D.C. area and decided that they really wanted to have an event that encapsulated of what their experience was, but also give that encouragement. Um, and the Sadie Collective was born out of that, named after Dr. Sadie Tanner Moselle Alexander, the first Black woman to get a PhD in economics in 1921 from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, she subsequently was a lawyer and worked for labor rights. Um, and so this collective idea was really about bringing people together. You can't do things alone bringing people together, having that representation and that collective voice advocating for, you know, a more diverse and more inclusive community within economics and then with policy, data science and finance as well. Perfect. Really important work that you all are doing. But well, tell me, how did you get affiliated uh, with the Sadie Collective? That's a great question. In 2022 now, early 2022, I was kind of looking out, I was working in higher education and maybe getting a little burnt out post COVID trying to figure out, okay, I know what I like to do. I know what I'm good at. Um, I had previously run a DC internship program through University of Wisconsin, really enjoyed that, was teaching a lot. And I was understanding how students were connecting their school experience to work experience and really enjoyed fostering that path. And I really wanted to get back to that. Um, and so truly just normal job searching on LinkedIn and scrolling, scrolling, scrolling and finding this post about this executive director of the Sadie Collective position. And I'm like, hmm, let me find out a little bit more about that. And I was like, I should take my own advice that I tell students is, you know, you could do a little networking on LinkedIn. So literally sent a message to Fanta to say, hey, I saw this post. I would love to know more. Can we meet or is there something I can attend? And kind of the rest is history. I attended a seminar that they had about what they would expect out of the executive director position and who would come next and what they want to do moving forward. And I applied and kind of crossed my fingers and hoped that, you know, we would get to where we were. And luckily, that is what was happened. And so I joined in June of 2022. Um, and since then has been a really amazing experience. Perfect. I have so many questions for you. I'm going to yes, try to please. pace myself here. Uh, first, what attracted you um, in this position? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, since I was running my own like mini program through University of Wisconsin, I was like, I know I can run something, you know, from start to finish. Um, but specifically, of course, it was the focus on Black women and underrepresented backgrounds in these fields. I've, I didn't study economics necessarily, but I always knew that it was important and tied to some of these topics that we think about every day. Um, and some of that I learned, you know, with help from my students throughout my journey as the program director of Wisconsin and Washington program. We're talking about these large policy issues, and a lot of it comes back to economic policy, policy in general. Okay, so these are intersected. I've worked with the kinds of students that are interested in these types of things. I wanted to also reflect that I am helping to contribute to the diverse, the vast diversity that exists in the world to be represented in these fields as well. So that first named after an amazing woman, uh, first national president of the Delta sorority. Um, and so 
having that opportunity to go from working for maybe a predominantly white institution to an organization that was very focused on this representation and feeling like, okay, these people are motivated, these young women, young people, and they know what they want to do. And I'm serving them. And they're telling us, this is what we want to see. These are the kinds of experience we like. And then I get to kind of shape that for them um, with the support of many amazing people that are in our on our board of directors and on our advisory council. So it was really like, okay, I really love this, this view of the world of really reacting to what people are telling us on the ground and not being so far away from it. Um, small but mighty team. Uh, it can get stressful, but it's really, it's really fun to kind of be my own boss, kind of strategize, but then also be able to do that implementation piece so that that bird's eye view and the implementation go hand in hand. And we don't forget that's what we're supposed to be doing. You, you take a, take on the job and uh, Anna and Fanta, amazing personalities and individuals. They're so passionate about this. Uh, you take over their baby. How does that feel? That's a great question. You know, of course, the first few months is really just kind of getting the lay of the land. I'm feeling obviously nervous. I'm like, okay, so I did my own little thing in my corner of my university, but I wasn't necessarily, you know, doing op-eds or being on the covers of anything, you know, writing things like that. But I, uh, you know, I'm the kind of person that likes to learn by watching and by doing um, and then talking to as many people as possible. So one of the things I made sure to do was try to talk to as many former Sadie Collective, you know, staff members, um, those that have been involved for longer than I had of just understanding what they've enjoyed, where they hope to see us go, um, and taking a lot of notes. Like I have an ideas document that's just like really long with all the people I talked to those first three months and trying to understand, okay, how do I stay true to the mission? And then how do I put my spin on it and what I bring to the table, which is just a little, it's a little shift of just this professionalization, professionalization and sustainability focus, you know, obviously like being co-founders as students, as being early in your career, that's a lot of work, you know, yeah. they're going to school, going to work eight hours a day, doing this um, on the side. Mm -hmm. And I'm able to dedicate 40 hours plus a week directly to it. And so seeing what could come of that was really exciting, you know, to sit back, talk to the board of directors, talk to the advisory council, talk to all these people that have really been impacted by us and see that, okay, like, I think where this is where I want to go. Um, let's try it or let's have a discussion. Let's put it down on paper um, and actually seeing it come to fruition, you know, starting in June, the conference is until the next February. So really trying to plan for this event that I've been heard a lot about, didn't get to attend, and then showing up in February 2023, and it all clicking together saying, okay, like, this is where it all converges. This is where that feeling goes. I want to make sure that that stays. Uh, and then everything else is like the cherry on top of that. So it was it was definitely a slow process of trying to say, OK, I'm ready to kind of unveil what I want to do. I really wanted to replicate before I tried something new. Mm -hmm. And I think that worked out. I think, as you said earlier, there's a lot of interesting things coming, but we really wanted to make sure what we already do is well oiled machine and is doing what it's supposed to do. Well, uh, having the the privilege of watching the Sadie Collective from afar and seeing all the progress, uh, it's definitely in the right hand. So you've done a really great job. I just we just did an interview with Princess War, a student of mine that first NKU student to attend the Sadie Collective conference, and we, she came back. Um, I, I don't want to say a totally different person because she was always a, a great student, always motivated. But what the conference did is, in her words, made her feel seen and made her feel like she knew what to do next. So she's already signed up to do research with me this summer. Um, so I want to say thank you for encouraging our students uh, to, to uh, find their own path and find the resources that they have on campus. Okay. What would you say are the portfolio of programs that you have right now? Yeah, that's a great question. I like to start off with our three main programs, and then I can share a little bit of what we're trying to do. So 
The first and foremost, as you just mentioned, is our annual conference. It's called the Sadie TM Alexander Conference for Economics and Related Fields. Started in 2019, it was hosted at Mathematica here in Washington, D.C., where I'm based. Uh, and so it is really an evolution of making sure that we are putting uh, Black women and econ economists of color up on stage, giving them platforms. Um, so it started out very simple, you know, symposia, got some great people to talk, and since evolved from 2020 on to making sure we had a career fair at every conference, making sure that there's some celebration of research, whether it's for graduate students or for undergraduate students, some form of intro to networking, mentorship, creating those lasting connections in some way, being that first focal point there. Um, and then, of course, that platforming of here are some really amazing aspirational people in these fields. They can give great advice. But then here's also your peers that want to give advice that have gone through it or are closer to what your experience is. So that is usually every February, Black History Month, the third weekend. Now it's hosted at Urban Institute, the main part of it. And then we have a welcome research reception at Brookings Institution. And at that research reception, we really are encouraging undergraduates that are interested in research, doing research, um, and understanding that they don't always necessarily get a chance to share that research. There are opportunities here and there for undergraduates nationally to present. Uh, and we wanted to add to that, add to that portfolio of, oh, I could, I can say I gave a poster presentation of my research at the Brookings Institution where, you know, it's open to all of their staff, open to the public in DC. You know, we have 10 plus institutions, higher education institutions, all those faculty they come and get to interact with the students directly and, you know, maybe challenge them in their thinking, you know, obviously applaud them in their work and commitment there. So we love having that opening research reception piece. Uh, and then, of course, like I said, the career fair, this was born out of, OK, so we know that there's a representation issue. We know that there are these organizations looking for people. How do we marry these two in a way that is a lower stakes entry point for students that might feel a little bit uh, intimidated by, you know, the industry um, and wanting to figure out, okay, who do I talk to? How do I do this? We say that our annual conference is a great way for students to see a face of a, a recruiter and put a face to the organization and, you know, use that as the first launching point to get to their next, you know, to their next career point. So we're really excited about that annual conference. We sold out this last year. We had over 300 people. Thank you. We had travel scholar, grant scholars. We had about 20 of them from all over the country. So we were able to give out $750 to each student, each travel grant scholar to be able to come to our conference. And then we had those 11 research scholars. So we are really excited to be able to be accessible in that way and make sure that our costs are as low as possible, you know, to deliver still a really great event. So that is our main flagship event. We call it SACE in, for short. Uh, and then the next one um, is the Exploring Career Pathways program with the Chicago Federal Reserve. Uh, and so this was born in the pandemic of a solution that is a one day version of our annual conference, but with the focus of the Chicago Fed and having them have the opportunity to share, you know, what it is that they do. It is locally based. It's in Chicago. We go to Chicago for that. We invite local students, both college students and high schoolers, and we bring them on site to interact and network and learn about what it is that the Chicago Fed is really there for. It's serving them. You know, it's not just a beautiful building in downtown Chicago. It is working for the people and really has its ear to the ground trying to do that. And so we are in our fifth year. This fall will be our fifth um, annual conference with them. And we're really excited about that one. You know, it's a very unique kind of partnership where, you know, through that we've had interns and RAs and full-time staff come out of us having this event. Um, it started virtually and now back in person uh, and then figuring out different ways to collaborate with local Chicago area, you know, financial institutions, that kind of thing. And I know one of your students last year uh, yeah. came to the conference and had a great time. And, and in fact, uh, was able to um, 
receive an RA ship or make a connection through the networks that were developed during that conference. So RO is currently at Princeton doing a free doc uh, there. So um, once again, another uh, success story, at least from the Northern Kentucky University, um, and, and hopefully we'll continue to have more of these. Absolutely. Yes. And then our final of the three flagship is called Exploring Career Pathways, the SADI Summit with JP Morgan Chase and Co. Uh, and this was an intro to is an intro to finance for sophomores. So those that are interested or actually studying finance are encouraged to apply to this three month virtual program that includes technical training through a forage course that JP Morgan Chase has put together. We do mentorship with JP Morgan Chase's Black Advocacy Forum. And then we do an on site summit in New York City at their headquarters to do networking, meet people at their investment bank, um, and encourage them to apply to the internships for the next summer because they're on a, you know, very accelerated schedule. You know, you apply this year for next summer. And so we are in the third year of that. We have our biggest cohort, 60 students. We started with 20. <laughs> um, and so we're really, we're really excited to see how that is going to come to fruition. We've had students apply to the internships, get those internships, and then become full-time staff uh, two years later. So that is a process that we're going through now. Our summit is next week, Friday. So we're excited okay. to be in person. Yeah. Okay. So that one's usually, is it annually in March or... Yes. So annually, the application usually opens in the fall. The virtual part of the experience starts January through March with the culmination of March uh, on site in New York City. Perfect. So many great things. Uh, so those are the three flagship programs yes. and each year they continue to grow and uh, get more and more support. Yeah. Um, is there are there any hidden uh, programs that we could uh, discuss? Yeah, absolutely. Right, so, tell me. yeah, so back in 2020, uh, the Sadie Collective won this one million black women grant from Goldman Sachs. Um, and that grant was to help us decide to figure out what we want to do with high school outreach, attempt to do high school clubs. You know, we say that we want to impact the pipeline, uh, build that pipeline and pathway for those that are interested in economics and related fields. And to do that, you have to start earlier and earlier and earlier. If you don't know that economics exists as a discipline or that those skills are needed uh, later on, you might be you might feel like it's too late. Um, I won't say that it's too late, but sometimes it can feel that way. Uh, so high schoolers have been a slight focus of ours. Um, and so we attempted that, took a step back and said, OK, how do we reevaluate? It's very hard to go into schools, <laughs> create clubs and make sure, you know, things are doing that from the outside are running from the outside. Um, and so upcoming this fall, we're hoping to launch a pilot mentorship program that's virtual um, in partnership with this app that we found, Mentor Pro. Um, so we're excited to do that. We took our time and got a planning grant from Peterson, Peter G. Peterson Foundation, and they helped us give us time to plan, you know, talk to teachers, talk to high school students, talk to those that create curriculum, decide what is missing and where can we plug in. And so we're hoping, you know, in the next few months to be able to launch, you know, what that's going to look like. Hopefully you'll see some curriculum coming out of us in partnership uh, with some people that you may know. Um, and then that mentorship program. And then, of course, we've always been making sure that students, high school students can join us at our annual conference. And so we've had this great uh, partnership with Wakefield High School in Arlington, Virginia. Their students come to D.C. for two nights, a night or two nights and come to our conference both days. Uh, and in Chicago, we have a partnership with Gwendolyn Brooks preparatory academy and they come to the exploring career pathways program in chicago so we make sure that we're trying to get those younger folks in the room so they can see have those curiosity points where they can say oh i saw that in person like i think i know what i want to do or i i was able to ask that uh question that sparked what i want to do later and we know that some of those high school students are now in college studying economics because you know, they were impacted by the program that we were able to do, which is super exciting to hear. Um, so that's a little bit about that. We're also launching a general, not just for high schoolers, mentorship program. 
Um, and so people can still sign up for that. If people are on our newsletter, that kind of thing. And I'm sure I'll share more about that. Um, and then we are looking for and have been working on this monograph series. We want to kind of document the pathway to becoming an economist. You know, we hear these stories here and there about what it's like, which how windy the paths are, which is great. But I think we want to put it down on paper. We want to show people and tie it to maybe some systemic issues that we might want to uncover, but also ways that, you know, people can still persevere, succeed in this uh, journey to either becoming that PhD or understanding their version of what an economist is or being a policy professional, uh, that kind of thing. So we have some things percolating like that, and we're really excited to see what comes of those. That's fantastic. I, I ran the Center for Economic Education for about six years. So I know the importance of getting to the high school level and engaging that group of students so that they know and are aware of economics by the time they get to, to college. So kudos to you all for uh, putting that effort in. And if there's any way I can support in any effort, uh, please don't hesitate to, to, to reach out. I'm a big fan of all that you all are doing. Thank you. Uh, what, what is your biggest challenge today in in the work that you do? That's a great question. I think what I've been thinking about recently is you see these attacks coming on DEI, um, that uh, affirmative action ruling from the Supreme Court, and you, recently you'll see some op-eds and articles bubbling up about you know some organizations, larger organizations reworking how they talk about diversity and state attacks really on diversity and inclusion in higher education in general in grant giving. Um, and so on the back of my mind or front of my mind, a lot of the time is how do we make sure that we stay true to what our mission is, but be clear that this program is going to be useful to anybody that comes to the table, right? We say we focus on Black women because we know that you know, at these intersectionalities, they're the most impacted. Um, and we know we like to say Black Women Best, coined by Janelle Jones. If it is for Black women and designed for Black women, everyone will benefit from it, you know. And this is a saying that you, you'll you hear in different marginalized communities, but it's, it's true. If you're working to make sure the person with the least amount of privilege is getting to where they need to be, then everyone will succeed. And so we're thinking about what does that mean for our future programs, future partnerships, how we come to the table and get people to come to the table with us along in this journey. Uh, I think we started out really strong and have continued to maintain really amazing partnerships, which we are very thankful for and excited to see how they kind of evolve over the years. Um, but we're also thinking, you know, if we want to bring new people in, how do we still make sure that they understand what we want to do uh, and not try to dilute that in a way that is disingenuous to what we really want to do. So I'm hoping that, you know, we'll be able to make that clear so far. So good. There haven't been anything too crazy coming out of that. But um, yeah, I'm very optimistic in making sure because we have such solid footing, we started very strong uh, thanks to our co-founders, the founding teams and, you know, the community that really brings all of us together. Uh, we have not, you know, fallen by the wayside in terms of relevance in the field. And I think we'll, you'll only hear more about us as the, the years come. So I'm really excited about that. Yes, a hundred percent. And yeah, as as the landscape uh, changes, uh, I'd be interested to see how you have to adjust the the language. And yeah. these are all things that we're having to do in, unfortunately, in higher education yeah. is being able to adjust with uh, the changing tides, if you may. Uh, you have a very unique perspective because you engage students from across the country. Yeah. Um, do you, can you identify places that are doing it right and not saying that the other places are not doing it right, but some 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 good feel stories that we should look into? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Spelman College is a really great example. Very strong, amazing young black women, students of color there, uh, their economics program, their chair is on our board of directors. Uh, and they are making sure, you know, that they are building out programs from undergrad through grad school that is really focused on making sure that at every step of the way, if a student is interested in getting a PhD, they know where to go, how to do it, the research, the training. 
Um, and so that is a really amazing model to look at. Um, I love the Expanding Diversity and Economics program through University of Chicago, led by Clinton Johnson and through the Becker Friedman Institute. Um, I've met the students, they've added a, a week in DC, which is really phenomenal in partnership with Brookings Institution. And so this is bringing students from all over the country that might be already studying economics or know that they want to, you know, double major, uh, maybe with, you know, computer science or even journalism, you know, all kinds of interests. And they're giving them a deep dive um, in person at University of Chicago for two weeks, um, learning and doing research with professors, with RAs, and then bringing them to D.C. to see these amazing places, meet amazing people at the Board of Governors, um, at the World Bank, at the IMF. So that's a really amazing program to watch because um, I'm all about access. You know, the, if you just if you don't you don't know what you don't know. And so if a student is able to find a program like this and, and have their lives be changed, I think that's amazing. Um, I think, of course, the AA summer program has been instrumental um, from the start of at least making that pathway aware to people and showing them what it will take to stay on that pathway, right? So we have a lot of students that have done different versions of all of these programs within our communities. Um, and it's really helpful because, you know, someone coming up can say, has anyone done or applied to expanding diversity and expanding diversity and economics program? Can you help me? Um, and same to go with AA summer program and same with the Spelman College, you know, that student um, that is now at Spelman from a high school in Chicago. So we I really love any program that's focused on this access. Uh, I think there are some really interesting departments that support their students. Sometimes it's really hard, you know, higher ed budgets are, yeah. you know, it just depends on what you get. And so there are some very committed, I know a lot of very committed staff um, and faculty at different higher ed institutions that are making sure their students see opportunities like this. Um, and sometimes if they're able to make it possible for them not to put in their own money, but to have departmental money go towards it. So we had some groups from, you know, University of San Francisco, University of Virginia, um, be able to come through the generosity of their departments, which is always amazing to see. Um, and then we try we try our best to, you know, continue to make these kinds of things more accessible and let faculty and staff know so they can share with students. Uh, and that's how we try to raise funds. You know, we, we tell our partners that our goal is to make it so that we're not charging for anything. You know, we only charge for our conference right now. Mm -hmm. Food is expensive, you know, but, yeah. you know, if we're able to make it so that it's even less money or even free, that would make my world. You know, that's the kind of thing we don't want to gatekeep information. We want to bring everyone along for the ride. We want everyone in the room that can be in the room. Um, and we want to share that as far as possible. So I love when I find like organizations uh, to then share each other's work and then make sure that the students see that we're a united front. You know, yeah. if they come to Sated Collective, they'll see stuff about AA summer program. They'll see stuff about ED. They'll see stuff about University of Virginia sending students, you know, same for University of San Francisco, Princeton, you know, so we'll have well, I'm trying to build this like, you know, pseudo network to show students that, you know, people are in your corner. It's not that hard to find and we'll make sure it's all in one place for you. Yeah. Well, well, you've shared a lot of valuable resources. We'll make sure to include them in the show notes so we could amplify all of the organizations that are doing amazing things. Okay. Um, I, I know at, uh, you know, with my students uh, that are going through my programming, four of them have indicated that they're... Um, interested in joining you all next uh, February in, in DC. So we'll make sure to to support them however way we can. Um, as as you start to think about the next steps, Bolo, and, and, and your growth as a leader, what are the leadership qualities that you find yourself relying on a lot? And I'll tell you why I'm asking this question, because you yourself are a role model to a lot of people that are watching this right now. Thank and you. some of them might have aspirations to be Bola one day, right? So what are the leadership skills that you are tapping into and that you could encourage people to develop? Yeah, that's a, I love that question because 
sometimes I forget that I am doing something that maybe someone would want. So students sometimes ask to me and I'm like, I didn't major in economics. They're like, no, I know. <laughs> uh, so thank you for asking that. Um, I think the things that I have realized that are beneficial. Um, I'm a very adaptable kind of person. I, you know, I like to purport the strengths quest, you know, kind of learning your top five strengths and understanding that and adaptability has always been number one. And when I saw that, I, it all clicked, you know, I'm kind of go with the flow, try to understand people. I take in a lot of information. So input is up there with that. Individualization is in there. I love matching people with you know, opportunities, someone will say something to me and I'll say, oh, I think I know someone doing that. Let me make that connection. And I love doing that. I love hearing maybe months later, years later, maybe never. But, you know, sometimes that turns into, you know, a long term mentorship or even a job. And so I really found out when I was doing that Wisconsin Washington program that that strength is just listening to people, understanding their background um, and making sure that you keep that stuff in the back of your head when you're talking to new people uh, and being willing to share that information. You know, there's no use for me to not share that I might know someone that works at some organization. What is the point of me not sharing that, you know, um, when someone indicates the same kind of interest? So it's just taking a true interest in people and being willing to be genuine about what you want to do <laughs> for people uh, and then following through and doing it. Uh, I think. I could say and sit here all day and say that I do it, but I think you would find if you talk to, you know, former students or people that I've connected with that I do try to come through as much as possible on what I offer to do. Um, and so if I'm like, I think I know someone, let me ask if they're willing to be connected. You know, I try not to just, you know, send out emails, do introductory um, connections that way. So I think thinking about, you know, where are your strengths? Where have you seen that play out? Whether it is in school, whether it is, you know, in extracurriculars. Um, I was always like a stage manager in theater club. I was never the person on stage. I don't want to do that. And I saw that kind of come to fruition. You know, you're managing things in the background. You're thinking strategically. You know where things have to go, where they're coming on stage and going off stage, where you store them. Um, and so I think that's kind of the same thing I'm doing as an executive director and did as a program director in higher education. Um, it's just in different ways. I tend to like people. So I put myself in front of people and do it, but some people would end up, you know, staying in that, you know, backstage role, but making sure that everything flows really nicely. So I try to, I try to focus on that and remember that that's what is bringing me joy is that, you know, orchestration and that high level strategic planning and connecting with people is truly where it stems from. Yeah, that, that's really powerful. There's two things as you were talking that I, um, found insightful. One is the power of connections. And often we um, want to monetize our power to connect. And, you know, sometimes you just have to provide that as a service to the people around you or the way you add value to your community. The second thing is you highlighted your uh, background in the arts and theater as a a catalyst to your leadership skills. And if somebody's watching this and they're adjacent to economics, um, there, there's a lot of things that you could take from the world that you live in to leverage to uh, make a difference in organizations as you are doing right now, Bolo. Yeah, absolutely. I love connecting. You know, I would always talk to students, you know, when I'm looking at their resume, giving them feedback. Some of them would have, you know, I was a server. Should I delete that? And I'm like, wait a second. You were a server for three years at this place. Let's talk about more what you did there. You know, did you close out the cash register? <laughs> you counted your tips. You made sure people were served well. You've probably dealt with lots of different personalities. <laughs> You're probably organized. You showed up on time. Did they ever ask you to train new servers? So you were a trainer also. So it's thinking through those different things that you probably are just brushing over as if it's not a skill. It is a skill. And I always tell them, no, actually leave that on there and maybe even move it up, you know, and yeah. talk about it this way. Add a couple of bullet points to that. And students are always shocked. They're like, are you sure? I'm like, I know it. I am guarantee you that someone will ask you about this in your um, in your interview or at least reference it later on. And sure enough, you know, time after time, students are like, oh, wow, I didn't realize, you know, if someone else has a serving background, that is an easy way to connect with someone in an interview and connect with someone that works. Um, 
it's different when, you know, you have that background that all your connections get you these jobs. That's cool. But where we want to see some character and that really builds character where you're put in situations where you don't know what's going to happen and you still were able to persevere. And so I, I love talking about those outside things that mm-hmm. are really direct. They're actually not outside things. They're directly connected to the things that you need to do and things that will propel you into where you want to go. Uh, I just did a lecture a couple of weeks ago to my students about the power or the importance of self-advocacy and how do you tell your story. And with my current generation of students going through, this is one area where I see a a large gap where they've been uh, told that advocating for yourself is, um, you know, you're full of yourself, you're, uh, and and there's there's an art to self-advocacy and it's important for you to do it. Um, one question for you, for yeah. somebody in a comprehensive regional university, how can I help with your efforts? That's a great question. I think for us, we are just continuing to build our network. Uh, so sharing with us in wherever different spaces that you find yourself in is a huge benefit to us. I think People have been doing it and then sometimes in different places and not expecting to hear, oh, I actually have heard about the Sadie Collective, which I love. Um, I think people might tend to count themselves out of uh, being able to participate. And I think it's about reframing, you know, how people come to our programs and interact with us. It's yes, we will always center and focus on Black women. But again, as I said earlier, we are not doing it to exclude anybody. We want people, we don't want to talk into an echo chamber. We want people to be able to learn about what we're talking about, contribute, and take that back to the spaces that they're in, because not everyone can be in every space and vice versa. You know, we might learn something from someone that doesn't look like us or you can study the same way as us or think the same way as us. And we take that into consideration when we're talking about programming. Right. Um, So we want to make it a more, you know, mutually beneficial relationship towards anyone that's coming into our space. Um, But understanding that these are the kinds of people that are going to be involved the most, you know, the black women that we are seeking are there, they're the smallest population. And we want to make sure that that grows And we want to make sure that underrepresented folks feel like they have a space to connect with each other. Um, So I think that's the biggest thing that you could do is just share, share, share about us, Um, have people sign up for our newsletter, forward it to your students like you have. Um, We truly appreciate it. And we know that that's happening. Um, We just want more people to do it. Perfect. You could count on it. I'll make sure that happens. I'll make sure we add all of these resources in the newsletter to the show notes. Absolutely. Well, I just want to say thank you for taking time from your busy schedule to have this conversation with me. I know a lot of my students would benefit and our community would benefit from hearing all the amazing work you do. And I cannot wait to see all that you accomplish. Thank you so much for having me. It's been wonderful uh, and we'll stay in touch. Perfect. Thank you.